Hi, in a couple of our recent videos, I used a vacuum system to demonstrate different principles. In the video that I did on the can crusher, I used this vacuum system to produce a low pressure mercury vapor plasma in order to demonstrate the effects of magnetic fields on plasmas. And in the video that preceded that, which was the plasma tube, I go through some of the tips and the tricks of setting up a vacuum system to get the optimum performance out of it. And in that video, I touched on a subject that I want to expand about on today, and that is surface deadsorption. It's a big deal. Unless you have a true failure in your system, you've got a hole in your vessel or you've got a tear in your tubing, this will be the source of most of the gases that will contaminate your system. And in very high vacuum systems, ultra high vacuum, UHV systems, this is the real bugaboo in trying to reach very low pressures or very high vacuums because it represents a large reservoir of residual gas already in your system that has to be eliminated. Now, the cause of this is that every surface that's immersed in an atmosphere, me, the room, cameras, everything, it has a thin layer of very loosely bonded molecules, water and atmospheric gases. And those bondings are very, very weak, but they occur because of an interesting principle. The glass surfaces, say on a vessel, the silicon dioxide, has a silica and an oxygen nucleus that's surrounded by a covalently shared cloud of electrons. And the air molecules or nitrogen molecules consist of two nitrogen nuclei that again share a cloud of electrons. They're bonded covalently. When those two materials move very closely together, the nuclei from the surface have a very loose attraction to the electrons in the nitrogen, and the nitrogen nuclei also attract the electrons in the glass. Now, this is not a bond. It's not a covalent bond. It's not an ionic bond. It's not a magnetic bond. It's not an electrostatic bond. It's due to the slight distortion in the electronic orbitals that causes this slight stickiness. The reason it's significant is because it's weak enough that the gases that are on the surface are in equilibrium with the gases in the environment. So that at all times, gas molecules are hitting the surface and some of them are sticking. And then due to thermal vibrations, some of those gas molecules are boiling away from the surface. And so you have this equilibrium layer. And as the pressure is dropped inside of a chamber, as the gas molecules are pulled away from the, the environment, those gas molecules that are attached to the surface over time boil away and continue to contaminate the inside of the vessel producing gases that have to be pumped out. This is a real problem because it can take a very long time to get those gases out. Now, there's two ways that vacuum technicians will uh, deal with this. The, one, the first way is to try to eliminate the surface area or reduce the surface area because it's linearly related or proportional to the amount of surface you have. So you wanna use a vacuum vessel that is no larger than the experiment demands. Secondly, you want to make sure that the surfaces are both clean and smooth. If you look at this table or you look at me, the overall surface area, you can kind of estimate it's a couple of square meters. But the actual surface area from the molecular point of view, from that scale, is much larger because of pits and grooves and irregularities in the surface. So if you have a very smooth, clean surface, you're going to have the lowest surface area for a given vessel size. The other way that they deal with this is using heat. If you produce a vacuum and you generate heat, warm the surfaces, they will thermally boil away more of those gases more quickly. And so instead of taking days in order to reach a very high vacuum, you may take hours. And so most ultra high vacuum systems incorporate heating elements to bring the surfaces up to several hundred degrees centigrade in order to be able to drive those gases off. Now, almost any physical principle can be treated either like a hassle or a problem or a challenge or as potentially a tool. And in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm, I'm gonna show you that we can take advantage of that principle to produce a solid state vacuum pump without any moving parts. It depends on the use of a material called a molecular sieve. Now, in our recent video that I did on the virus, I demonstrated the performance of a molecular sieve. To review that very briefly, what it does is it consists of using an aluminum silicate mixture. 
that is formed into a sort of a clay-like paste. It is dried and then it is baked. And depending on what other kinds of chemicals are added at the time, some potassium salts or sodium salts, you can actually control the pores and the defects and the cracks that begin to develop as it's baked. And you can very carefully control the size of those pores and those defects so that you can produce a very selected range of increased surface area. Just to give you an idea of how significant that is, if you look at this little beaker here that contains about 200 grams of this aluminum silicate material, you can estimate or guess that this probably has a gross surface area, if you just look at the surface of the beads, of maybe a couple of square meters. But for any item or any particle or atom or molecule that's able to access the very small spaces inside of the beads, the actual surface area is close to 200,000 square meters. It's enormously higher. And so this can be used in order to be able to separate uh, different kinds of chemicals. For example, when we did the virus video, I used this property to be able to separate out the uh, alcohol and the water using a 3A molecular sieve, which stands for three angstrom pore size. Water molecules are about two and a half to 2.7 angstroms across. Isopropyl alcohol and ethanol are up around three to three and a half angstroms across. So when you take a mixture of water and alcohol and you pour it onto here, the water and the alcohol will soak the outside of the beads, but only the water is able to access that enormous surface area inside of the pores, inside of the cracks. So then when I pour the liquid off of this, most of the alcohol will, will leave. Only the stuff on the surface will be bound to these particles, but most of the water will stay behind. And so as a result, you're gonna end up with a concentration of alcohol. And depending on the size of the particle, the, the defects, you can use this in chemical or pharmaceutical manufacture to separate solvents and chemicals from each other. They make this in a 3A, 3 angstrom, 4A, 5A, and in this case, 13X. I'm not sure why they use the X, but this has a 10 angstrom size. And what's nice about this material is it's very, very cheap. This entire container here costs about $24 but you could get about 10 times as much of this for about $70. You can buy it by the drum. It's very, very inexpensive. And it not only can separate out for chemical purposes in liquids, it can also separate out gases because those forces that cause that attraction of the molecule to the surface, those van der Waals forces, van der Waals forces, differ between different molecular species. For example, oxygen is a little stickier than nitrogen. There was an interesting legend back from a couple decades ago on Mauna Kea, the observatory up at about 4,000 meters. And there was a maintenance worker that was dealing with uh, some ice storm damage that had occurred to the outer structure of one of the observatories. So he went over to the observatory, he cut out the damaged section, took the measurements, brought it back to the shop and cut out some sheet metal in order to do the repair. Brought the sheet metal back and found that it was too short. So he went back to the shop cut off some more material, brought it back, and it was still too short. Brought it back to the shop, cut off some more material, and it remained too short. And eventually he decided that his brain wasn't working properly. And that's what happens. Even to very fit people, when you go up to very high altitudes, you can't function very well. And it's an interesting thing. If you ever have the opportunity to do this, it's worth trying. If you go up to a very high altitude site, like Mauna Kea, about 4,200 meters, and you look at the sky, the clear sky, at this premier observing site, it's really not impressive. It looks worse than it does in many towns. It's very pallid, very, very dim. But if you put a mask on and blow a little oxygen at yourself for about two minutes, all of a sudden the entire night sky lights up with stars because the brain and the retinas are very, very sensitive to the level of oxygen. So what we discovered is that at another observing site that we were working with a few years ago, we were able to get a donation of what are called oxygen concentrators, medical oxygen concentrators. And they're very interesting devices. They involve a series of cylinders, stainless steel cylinders, filled with a 5A molecular sieve and a compressor and some valves. What they do is they compress and put a few atmospheres of surrounding air into the cylinder. And because the oxygen is a little stickier than the nitrogen, when you open the valve and begin to bleed off that compressed air, the first gases that leave are the nitrogen. And the last gases as it's decompressing are the oxygen. 
And so by cascading these, you can actually achieve oxygen concentrations up around 90%, and it's a heck of a lot easier than lugging bottles up to the top of a mountain. So this kind of a process, this sort of surface absorption with gases, is what we're going to use to generate the vacuum pump that we're going to demonstrate right here. Now, when I told you about this vacuum pump in the previous videos, I really like the Yellow Jacket pumps. And I've got this hooked up in such a way that what we're going to do is I'm going to evacuate this. I'm going to show you the pressures that we can reach with the meter with nothing in it. So we're just the surfaces of the glass and the capabilities of the pump. And within a couple minutes, I'll show you how good a vacuum we can achieve. So we'll start with me turning on the pump. It's going to get a little loud. Now, if you look at the meter over here, it's off the scale. Basically, there's atmospheric air in there. When I open this valve, you will hear the sound change and you'll see the vacuum pressure very quickly drop here. Now, we'll give this just a minute or so to be able to drain the pressure, but you'll see how low a pressure we can get with this pump. Now, when they talk about microns or millimeters, that's the theoretical pressure of how high the atmospheric pressure would lift a column of mercury. At these pressures, it's theoretical, but that, that's sort of the relative measure that this is comparing to. So when they say microns of, of pressure, that means how many microns you'd lift, lift a column of mercury. Now you can see within just about 20 seconds, we're already down to 30 microns. And the pump, which is specced at only 25 microns, that means straight into a, a meter, is under spec, kind of unusual for most products nowadays about 22, we might get to 21. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the pump and I'm going to fill this with some molecular sieve. 20. Now we'll take this flask out. And I'm going to fill this with some molecular sieve. Little trick for the funnel is because there's a um, vacuum grease here, I don't want to get the particles on that that can damage the seal when we try to put this back on. One eternity later. Not bad. All right, now we'll close this. And now we're going to pump it out again. Now you'll watch the vacuum valve and you'll see what kind of vacuum we can reach. Now the only thing I've changed is I've just added the desiccant. Everything else is exactly the same. Now you can see it's starting to slow down a little bit. Now I know this may be boring, but the reason I'm doing this real time is simply because you can see how much longer I'm pumping and how much less we're getting down to that 20 that we saw last time. I'll never get there. So you can see there's a clear difference. I mean, this thing is just maybe we'll get to 80 in you know, another 10 minutes or so. Nevertheless, this is, this is the starting point. Now, in order to create a pump out of this, what we're going to do is I'm going to raise this up. I'm going to put a little insulation around here, and we're going to run the temperature up around this to about 300 degrees centigrade. The desiccant will tolerate, or the molecular sieve, will tolerate about 350 degrees centigrade, and the glass will tolerate about 550 degrees centigrade. So with my little probe and my little heater, I'm going to run this for about a half an hour under vacuum at about 300 degrees centigrade to drive off all of that gas. And then I'm going to show you what happens. So let's put this up. 
Okay. A little of this fiberglass rope around here. And now we're going to turn on the heat. Okay, you can see it's been about a half hour, maybe 35, 40 minutes. And the temperature, as it's continually risen, has driven more and more of the gas into the chamber. And this pressure has continually raised slowly as that gas is being driven off. There's no leak. This is just the gas that comes off of the surface as it's being driven out thermally. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the heat off, and we're going to take this out. And we're going to let it cool closer to room temperature by lowering the heating element, the mantle here. And then once this gets closer to room temperature so that I don't crack the glass, I'm then going to immerse this in liquid nitrogen. And we're going to bring the temperature way down to 77 degrees K. And with that, we'll be able to absorb, adsorb, sorry, a lot more gas. So we'll give this about 10 or 15 minutes to drop down to room temperature, and then we're going to immerse this in the nitrogen. I'll see you in a little bit. All right, giving this a solid 45, maybe even 50 minutes to heat and then to cool down to room temperature. And we're down to about 55 degrees centigrade. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna immerse this in liquid nitrogen to bring the temperature way, way down. You'll notice the pressure right now is at about 27. So that's the baseline of the pump and just about what you can do without any desk in it at all. Science is fun, isn't it? Now this will take a little while because of the vacuum in there. In order to conduct the heat from the beads that are in the middle, they have to be conducted through the material rather than say through air. And so it's gonna take a little while for them to drop all the way down to the baseline temperature. But when they have been cooled, we should stop seeing this boiling action occurring around the vessel. Now you can see the temperature's already dropped down, I mean the pressure's already dropped down to 15, 14, 13. We're now below the spec of the pump and lower than we even got with an empty, empty uh, glass vessel. Now I'll give this about five minutes for all the heat to distribute and then I'm going to show you how this can be used as a solid state pump. Now the pressure right now about 12 microns and this has been sitting here for about five minutes and you can see very little is boiling off here so we're probably pretty much at equilibrium temperature throughout the particles throughout the uh, molecular sieve. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn off the pump, seal it, turn it off. Now what's interesting is the pressure will hang around here for a fairly long period of time just based on you know leakage from my fittings but what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up this valve and I'm going to add some air in here and you're going to watch what happens to the pressure when I do that. Watch the meter carefully. You also see some of this bubble when I do that because the air is going to heat it.
Now I'm going to close it again. And we'll watch what happens to the pressure. No pump. Now why this is significant is because this kind of a pump is actually used commercially. It's called a sorption pump or a cryo pump. Typically in those kinds of pumps they will actually take sheets of stainless steel and bond to them or mount on them some of this molecular sieve or something similar to this molecular sieve. And then they will actually cool them off all the way to liquid helium temperatures, much colder than liquid nitrogen. And they will then absorb gases that or adsorb gases including gases like oxygen and nitrogen and even hydrogen and neon and argon, carbon dioxide, because it will not only stick but it will also condense. And they have a very, very high pumping speed and they're also very clean and there are no moving parts. They're used in particle accelerators and uh, fusion uh, generation systems. And so it's an interesting kind of phenomenon because it really does work. It does pump. Where it matters to us is that this will not substitute, say, for a diffusion pump or a vacuum pump based on, say, a turbomolecular system because it's obviously dead end. You're going to fill up the beads and then they're not going to work. But for a relatively low pumping capacity, or if you're trying to evacuate a, low ve a small vessel that contains dangerous materials, mercury, uh, heavy metals, toxins, uh, solvents, things that you don't want to get into the air, you don't want to get into the vacuum system, you can use a system like this to draw the, the toxic materials into the beads. And then when you're done with the experiment, the process, you can actually just take the beads and throw them in a hazardous waste bin. You can just dispose of them because this is probably about two bucks worth of molecular sieve. So it's kind of a neat thing to have as a tool in your armamentarium of vacuum systems. And if we wait a little bit longer, we'll see that the pressure will actually continue to drop. So Hopefully this was kind of interesting, and uh, as we get on with other kinds of experiments with these systems, we may go back and visit, revisit some of these little principles, some of these little lab tricks. But if you have any questions or you want to make any comments, please post them below the video because I read them all and I try to answer as many of the questions as possible, and it gives me ideas for additional videos, so I, I really appreciate the feedback. In addition, if you like what we're covering here, please subscribe because it helps us to grow and that helps us to get more recognition by larger channels as well as YouTube for recommending our videos. And if there is still a bell present and you hit the bell, always remember that when the bell is clicked or, or hit, it will give you the choice of all or personalized. And if you leave it, don't push it. Personalized will just redirect you to any of our videos that are consistent with what you normally watch. So if you watch cute cat videos, Unless we do something on cats, you're not going to see one of our videos, even if you're subscribed. If you hit all, you'll be, you'll be notified of everything we produce. So I hope you found this interesting. I want to uh, say thank you very much for watching. You stay safe, and you have a good evening.